Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we're offering five conversations from episode 20, our discussion with Donna Cryer about the challenges for patient advocates and, for that matter, all key stakeholders as the issues become more urgent, complex, and practical. Plus, from the vault, conversation 46.5 from season three, the wrap-up conversation from last summer's NAFLD Summit coverage. This week's vault comes from our September 2022 coverage of the NAFLD Summit, and most of it revolves around debates on the issue of use of NITs. It starts with a fairly complete summary of the conversation itself, so I'll go no further. Just keep listening. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about that whole debate around uh, NITs the Thursday afternoon, where uh, you were on the podium trying, Mazen, trying to trying to light uh, Quentin up. Mazen Nuruddin. Among other things. <laughs> but he, he was very balanced and took it well. I was trying to put Kaz on fire between Vlad and Quentin, I know. So, I mean, I can start with the first presentation, it's, which I gave about the serum biomarkers. At the end of the day, I can give you the summary. I think eventually we're going to move uh, between combination and serum biomarkers, and it has been said by multiple times in this conference that one NIT by itself, it's not going to be the answer we think uh, for now. It's probably going to be a combo combo, as we say, combo. On, and we said that on this podcast multiple times, combination of non-invasive testing to risk stratify, find at-risk NASH patients, and then mention response to treatment. And in terms of the serum biomarker, I just don't want to go by one by one, but I will summarize it in terms of the context of, of use. Uh, I will say the two stage and find that Trist Nash were at a very good place. Outcomes, I want to say, the first one is probably excellent. Outcomes, I think we have good data. We are totally conscious to what the regulators want. They want larger cohorts, prospective. And the example that was given, like the New England Journal paper for outcomes. And I think we're in the process of doing that. And lastly, I think the best paper was done on treatment response was from the Regenerate data by first authors, Mara Rinella. And it's still, it, it shows you that we need more work on the response to therapy. So if it, for instance, they showed individual markers, ALT, for instance, correlate with histology, worsening and improvement. But by itself, it was not good enough. And I'm surprised they didn't combine the NITs in that paper and looked at the combination and their uh, correlation with improvement in histology. And then if you want to comment on serum or someone to comment on the imaging biomarkers, please feel free. I'll stop with, with this first. Hannes Hockstrom. I'm um, so just a general non-invasive comment is that, that we, we touch upon sometimes but not always is where do we want to use the sad biomarker for instance i mean we sometimes forget that this is a population disease with a huge prevalence and then the first line biomarker needs to be in primary care and then it needs to be extremely cheap and simple to use so i don't think we can have a very complicated biomarker built on bioinformatical approaches and things like that uh, that are that is very complicated to set up that we want to use in a primary care setting because there is where the patients are found. So there we need something very, very cheap and, and simple. So sometimes we forget that. No, I totally agree with that. I personally, I'll tell you, that's my intake on that. I am 100% with that. We need to increase awareness and education and the biomarkers in the primary care or people that they are not involved in the liver should be simple, cheap, and cost-effective. Yet, I don't think necessarily eventually in hepatology clinics, especially when we have drugs, I don't think we will use the same set of biomarkers. And I'm actually going to quote one of your papers, the FIP4. I think the FIP4 is, uh, and I told you I'm a fan of that paper, the FIP4, I think it's an outstanding step by both AGA and ESO. And it's probably going to be ASLD. I'm not sure what the algorithm they're going to come up. And it's going to move us from missing a lot of patients in primary care to the right step identifying them and sending those. And it's been used in hepatology clinic, but eventually the hepatologist, after they get the patient identified, with a good test for like and cheap, they have to do a little bit deeper dig and find at risk and F2 and all that. And uh, and on one of the summary sl- slides, I said new biomarkers are still welcomed, although some people say it's like competitive, too many and all this. And one of the papers I use is yours that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, when you showed that people in the low or indeterminate zone, almost half of them had clinical outcomes at the end. So what we found in that particular paper was that in a general population of 100 of thousands of people, uh, 140, I think it was, then of those that do develop liver-related outcomes, that is decompensation or progression to cirrhosis or liver cancer, almost half will actually be in the low group if you only measure FIB4 one time. But if you repeat your FIB4 sampling, you can increase that proportion. But I certainly agree that this is the first line biomarker, and then you can, of course, have more advanced things going on in, in secondary tertiary care. 
what what I would also like to try to do is that you know Fib4 it has a few years back now it's been designed to pick up F3 F4 in patients with HIV HCV co-infection it seems to work very very nice also in other liver diseases but it is a diagnostic marker it should be possible to you know, recalibrate this given the current situation we are in so we have recalibrated mal things like that I think it's um, be very interesting for a recalibration of the Fib4 to be used in a general population and also recalibrate maybe for use as a prognostic biomarker for prognosis. I just have a quick comment on that. I, I, sm- I smell papers coming. That's my comment. <laughs> a word of caution though. I, I think of course the needs are very important for the future but we're talking a lot about the limitations of the liver biopsy. We're talking very little about the limitations of those non-invasive tests. They all have their limitations. Intraperson variability, interlab differences, all things that we need to take into account and, and also for liver stiffness if you measure it today or you measure it in two weeks it can be quite different so we really need a combination of markers and take into account their intrinsic variability and it's only by combining whether it's histology or serum markers imaging markers that is something especially if we want to assess evolution over time and treatment efficacy it will need to come from a well thought combination of parameters so that you can account for that intrinsic variability and the limitations that all these different parameters have whether it's histology or something else. I think that makes excellent sense Sven and if we were in the States, this conversation would have had a lot more fiber scan and MRE in it because the economics of healthcare in the States just says there are a lot more fiber scans and MREs around. And in fact, I was surprised there wasn't more VCTE in this meeting. And then I said to myself, I know why there just aren't as many devices. I think you're right. I mean, balancing cost and all kinds of other issues. Mazen, go ahead if you have something you want to. I just, before we move to the NIT, I just want to repeat what the regulators are looking for. And as the help of my colleagues, if I understood it correctly, some of you, I was in a different country. I was in Argentina with, with the Paris Nash, but there were multiple discussions in Paris Nash as well as here, what the regulators want to have NIT as a primary efficacy endpoint, for instance, in registered study. And the conclusion I'm getting, and I, I'm really like trying to make sure I got it correctly. The conclusion is that we are not ready yet. We need more data. Some examples were given, which was the New England Journal paper about outcomes and prospective large cohort studies, which was initially discussed in different episodes. You can go back to that one is the NAIL NITs, a large study with NITs and outcomes. But that was my understanding from the regulators. I don't know if anyone got a different kind of sense from them or has a better idea that how we can do that retrospectively to convince them to replace a liver biopsy in phase three studies. So that's something I think about quite commonly. You know, we were one of the groups showing that if you do a retrospective study showing that fibrosis is a key marker of prognosis, which is at least what I think partly convinced FDA and EMA to, to use this as a surrogate outcome. So why can't we then also do large scale retrospective studies of, for instance, now fiber scan or, or non-invasives to show the same thing. Actually, there are studies showing that the prognostic in- information you get from this uh, fiber scan is comparative to that you get from a liver biopsy. So some information was presented here where showing that actually if you show that the pr- regression of fibrosis might be associated with lower risk of outcomes, but I think the same thing can rather soon be shown for also for VCTE measurements. So we now it's been around for quite a few years now so we should be able to do those kind of studies i agree the question is uh, i totally agree 100 percent but it didn't it didn't feel to me that the fda is ready to take that if you if you guys agree sven frank i agree but i just don't understand why i'm with you if if i understand they are open to consider it i think that elmer schnabel even used the word sympathy but that they are not convinced by the current data that we have so i think we need to come up with much more data especially the correlation between treatment response and the evolution in those nits and what the magnitude needs to be to translate into an efficacy Endpoint, so. That's true. And to give them a credit, I think they really want to go the direction we all want to, which is NIT, replacing liver biopsy, even in clinical trials. But at the end of the day, they, they have responsibility and golden standards for agencies to go by. I think they're asking us to come forward with more and more data and go to them and try to replace it. And we're in the process of starting these conversations and continuing them and hopefully move that forward. Sometimes
sometimes it feels a little bit to me like watching an eight-year-old try to go off a diving board and they get to the end and they just stand there and they stand there and they stand there and they stand there and they stand there and you don't know what's going to make them jump until ultimately their father or mother comes along and pushes them. Uh, I don't know where that push is going to come from, but it is kind of how it feels to me. So at any rate, we're at the bottom of the hour. So before we go to wrap up, is there anything else in that meeting that anybody wants to make sure that we comment on because our audience should hear it? It's a totally off-topic thing, but I think it was very impressive to see that there were actually some Ukrainian scientists coming here to present their data, which is very remarkable in, in the current situation. So I thought that was very nice to see. Just a minor point about the liver biopsy, because we discussed that a lot, but still I was impressed by the new techniques that can help us improve the information we get from the biopsy. And although, of course, the biopsy will not be there for routine clinical practice, but it's still a very valuable tool, a, a lot of information also to help us understand the disease. So that that was a, an important message, I think, also from this meeting. My final word, just want to congratulate Manolis, Emilia and Frank for organizing this outstanding meeting. And for Easel in general, they, they have been changing the field significantly with J-HAP and such meetings. So let's keep it going and change the field. Yeah, they've done really well. I'll tell you what my scariest moment of the meeting was when Vlad suggested that the U.S. hepatologists, no, actually he said about Tina uh, and about uh, Valerie, that they come over to the States and they could train all the hepatologists who aren't doing liver biopsies to do liver biopsies. And then we could do enough liver biopsies to treat all the patients. And I was like, oh God, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I think we have good people also in the US. I tell everyone, I'm like, I'm, I'm an American citizen married to a European. So by heart, I'm both. So. In closing, when we come back here next year, or back to this meeting next year. I don't, I don't know if it's going to be in Dublin next year. When we come back to this meeting next year, what will have changed? What's the one most important thing, in fact, that will have changed over the next year? Brave one, go first. You can have the resmitterum and the beta colic acid decisions. Um, let's see what else is going to finish. I think those are the, the, the major ones and many phase twos they, they will read out. I think it will hopefully will look more rosy uh, by, by next year. And from my own bias, we'll start the NIT outcome study to replace biopsy in phase three studies. And those are my major highlights. Okay, go ahead, Hannes, Sven, whoever wants to go next. I can echo Mas and other. I think those two studies will be very, very interesting to see final results from. And hopefully that will trigger the field to even more activity. So I'm um, looking forward to one year from now. Meanwhile, in terms of trial design, we, we will improve. There's a, also a conference on the interorgan crosstalk that hopefully will help us to get our minds set about how we are dealing with that in clinical trials and then later on also in routine clinical practice. So, uh, a lot to, come. to me, the conceptual difference is follows from what you just said, Sven, which is that this meeting talked about the role of liver and fatty liver and metabolic disease more holistically than I've ever seen before. And I've been doing everything for the last three or four years, and it has moved a lot, but this felt like a whole leap ahead. I'd like to believe that leap is going to continue. And I think between that leap continuing and if uh, Resmeterome and Oka do well, the money that will come into the space will just be rolling next year. Anybody have anything else they want to add before we say goodbye? No, I can just confirm that the content of this meeting was excellent. And I think we should really congratulate the three organizers on a very smart design of the program. That has been really key, I think, to make this meeting a success. Smart design is the right word, actually. Smart design is the right word. And... Since you can't see video, if you're in the audience, that you don't know that Hannes gave it the thumbs up also. So with that, let's sign off. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. Next week, Easel Vice Secretary Alexandra Krag and Education Counselor Sven Franke will be joining us to begin our preview of the 2023 Easel Congress. Should be fascinating. Should be fun. So until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye now.